Marika thought of all the funerals that had passed through the gates of Highgate. The Victorians' black carriages pulled by ostrich-plumed horses with professional mourners and inexpressive mutes had given way to this motley collection of autos, umbrellas and subdued friends. Marika suddenly saw the cemetery as an old theatre. The same play was still running, but the costumes and hairstyles had been updated. Robert touched Martin's shoulder, and Martin opened his eyes with the expression of a man abruptly woken. They walked across the courtyard and through the opening in the centre of the colonnade, up the mossy stairs, into the cemetery. Marika walked behind them. The rest of the mourners followed. The paths were slippery, steep and stony. Everyone watched their feet. No one spoke. There was no ghost in the book until about the middle of the proceedings. It started off as a novel about a man who can't leave his apartment and a woman who comes and visits him. And my way of working is that I get some idea and then I start to try to grow it by asking questions. And so the questions I was asking were things like, well, okay, so where does he live? And I would try to visualize the flat. And so in my mental flat, this flat's full of boxes, and I looked out the window, there's a cemetery. And at first I thought I was in Chicago, and I thought the cemetery was this very famous one called Graceland. Uh, not to be confused with Elvis's Graceland. Memphis Graceland, yeah. Right. So uh, anyway, I started by thinking that and then I said to myself well what's the most spectacular cemetery what's the best cemetery and the coolest one I had ever been to was Highgate so uh, so I thought okay great we're in London and at the beginning of a project you're making these fairly random decisions because you don't know what the implications will be but by suddenly transporting the whole proceedings to London and, and turning it into Highgate I had casually stumbled upon this amazing thing, kind of a secret world. And so as I continued to add characters, suddenly I had twins, and then one of the other people who lives in this um, apartment building suddenly became a cemetery guide, because you can't come into this part of the cemetery without a tour guide. And so things kept multiplying, and eventually I actually got in touch with the cemetery and asked them if I could come over and talk to them, and they agreed. So, uh, so I understand so I, I had an interesting response to the <laughs> suggestion you were going to write a book. Well, I mean, at the time that I first contacted Highgate's office, um, my first book hadn't been published yet, so I was a very meek, unpublished author. And so uh, when I phoned up, I was put through to Mrs. Jean Pateman, who at that moment and for quite a long time was the chairman of the Friends of Highgate Cemetery. And uh, Jean rather famously said, uh, in response to my proposal that I should come and base a novel in the cemetery, she said, oh, my dear, I don't think that would be a very good idea. <laughs> but, um, but in the end, Jean was absolutely the best and the most generous person, and uh, she really helped me a lot. I ended up dedicating the book to her because she was just so incredible. Elspeth died while Robert was standing in front of a vending machine watching tea shoot into a small plastic cup. Later, he would remember walking down the hospital corridor with a cup of horrible tea in his hand, alone under the fluorescent lights, retracing his steps to the room where Elspeth lay surrounded by machines. She had turned her head towards the door, and her eyes were open. At first, Robert thought she was conscious. In the seconds before she died, Elsbeth remembered a day last spring when she and Robert had walked along a muddy path by the Thames in Kew Gardens. There was a smell of rotted leaves. It had been raining. Robert said, we should have had kids. And Elsbeth replied, don't be silly, sweet. She said it out loud in the hospital room. But Robert wasn't there to hear. Originally, I started, I had this idea that the novel began with the twins getting off a plane and arriving in London, and then the story would begin. And as I got interested in Elsbeth, I realized that really the story starts back where Elsbeth dies, that that's the thing that sets everything else in motion. 
And so that's where I ended up starting. Once you have a character, the character needs other characters. So for the twins to have such a fabulously expensive flat in one of the most expensive parts of London, they need to inherit it. You know, how else are, are young persons going to get their hands on something like that? So I thought, okay, what's the most cliched possible thing? Okay, they have a rich aunt who dies. So having killed this character before she even existed, I started trying to think who she might have been and what she was like, and suddenly came up with this idea that she herself was a twin, because I was trying to get an absolutely ridiculous amount of doubling and twinning in there. So now we have two sets of twins. And then I started thinking about Elsbeth as she suddenly became, and I really liked her. I thought she was interesting and cool, and I wanted to write about her, but I had already killed her. <laughs> so I thought, right, okay, she's a ghost. And so that's how she became a ghost, and that's how she got stuck in her flat. This is one of the more famous uh, monuments. This is George Wimwell's lion. In order to research the story, you, uh, you became a guide here. Yes, I did. I was learning to guide, not because I was planning to guide, but because my character needed to guide, and there was going to be a tour in the book. And uh, yeah, when Jean realized that I actually had acquired the knowledge set that you need to guide, she said, well, why don't you guide? And is that something you're, you're planning to continue after the publication of the novel? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, are you kidding? If you, if you do all the work and make your tour, you want to keep doing it. It's so fun.